So it's really great to be here with you all today and of course to have a conversation with uh, Samson Kambalu. For those of you who haven't um, heard him speak, um, he has a very expansive and <coughs> divergent and imaginative approach to his art practice, as you will have seen, and it's always a pleasure to speak with him. So in 2017, uh, Samson was appointed Professor of Fine Art at the University of Oxford, and since then he and I have had an ongoing conversation really about subjective self-development through engaging with art and philosophical ideas. And um, it's been a healthy exchange of ideas that's ongoing, and I've certainly learned a lot about uh, matrilineal society in Africa and masks and grill, which you can tell us all more about. So just a quick uh, overview. I'll speak just briefly with an introduction and then we'll have the conversation side because often once Samson gets started talking, it just flows. <laughs> so Samson was born in 1975 <laughs> in Malawi, in sub-Saharan Africa, and he lived for 25 years in South East Africa before moving to Northern Europe. And that move prompted him to write the first ever memoir, of childhood in Malawi, um, which had only become independent from British rule less than a decade before he was born. And that book, Jive Talker, is delightfully witty, and it's a very unsentimental account of growing up in a modern African family. And I mention that book because in that self-narration, Samson discloses his primary concern, really, which is the undercurrent of tension between Western industrial patriarchy as a form of thinking and understanding the world and the African heritage centred more on abundant ideas of time and gift economy. And the cultural interaction of those two different worlds is really playfully addressed through Samson's work as he seeks out a commonality between those two things. In Malawi, he's credited as a pioneer in conceptual arts, due largely to initially the Holy Ball intervention in 2000. Mm. And for the last decade, the Nau cinema films have been exhibited around the world. And in the UK, they're in the national art collections of Tate and British Council Contemporary Art Society. During his fellowship at Yale in 2013, he slightly mischievously photographed the whole of the Sanguinetti archive, which had been gifted to them, and then presented it as part of the main exhibition in the Venice Biennale in 2015. So really stretching the idea of what property and ownership is um, in and around art and ideas. The thing with yeah. Samson's artistic practice is that he's always exploring what it is to exist in this moment as a sovereign individual thrown into the world in a certain geography, in a particular moment in time, and creating social interactions through art to kind of find his place in the world. And that practice just continues all the time. And then there's certain moments where he makes public what he's researching and where he's up to in that thinking through events. Um, this exhibition is one of those events, essentially. So I'm now going to ask you around, there's essentially in postcards from the last century at Pier Gallery, there's essentially five bodies of work that are kind of woven in together and the audience are expected to interweave within the space as one installation. So we're just going to segue out the kind of different five aspects. And would you first talk about, Samson, the Benny flags? Um, usually okay. flags, of course, are symbolic mm -hmm. abstracts of uh, an idea of a nation at a certain point in history, but you're playing more with other aspects too. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the terrific introduction, I must say. Um, um, okay, let's start with the Benny Flags. The Benny Flags, uh, the undercurrent of uh, postcards from the last century is um, Malawian syncretic cultures. So, um, the syncretic culture came from the two world wars. Uh, when the African soldiers returned from Europe and Asia, they brought back with them different ideas, but also lots of clothes, well, clothes. And, and this is the origin of African dandyism in African syncretic culture, because what happened is that uh, the, uh, whatever the soldiers learned in, in, in the British Army, they brought back and turned it into a Malawian culture. 
So the, the, let's say the, uh, the parades, the, 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 the marches were turned into a dance. So the word ban comes from the word band, you know. Um, and uh, flags are evolved in, in, in Bain because it's a military match, really. And, uh, but that has turned into something else. Um, I think it was a way of maybe these men assimilating themselves back into African society. Um, and, um, um, but what strikes you about Maori syncretic culture is, is its kind of irreverence. Irreverence of, 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 of British military discipline and, and even Western culture. Um, syncretic culture, such as Beni, is one of them. There's also another dance called Malipenga, and then there's another called Mganda. They were at the forefront of kind of colonial resistance, you know. And when, when the soldiers started doing this in the villages, turning military par parades into um, dances, uh, uh, the British government did protest. They tried to stop it, but it didn't work. It really mobilized the grassroots. And, and so um, these dances, along with the emergence of African dandyism, where, you know, they've always been at the forefront of African politics. Um, I don't know. Uh, so I call these flags Beni because yes, they were inspired by that culture. Mm -hmm. There's from, an aspect the of parody so. and performance within yeah. the Beni videos. You can see online still some of these films. They're really amazing in terms of this use of um, mm -hmm. occupying the space essentially of taking a, a kind of parody and performance and play in a very particular way. And the flags as uh, objects, as you have them in pier, would you mm. talk a bit about that, those abstract works and how you're playing with ideas of nationalism with those flags? Yes. I think the thing that strikes you about uh, like the, a certain philosophy that I'm coming from in Malawi is the Nyao Kacha. And, and the, the thing that's, I think you Nyao now, the, the Muscan tradition is part of the UNESCO World Heritage. So, but what's striking about it is, is that it's prehistoric, I think. You know, the Niao philosophy is even older than the concept of God, because in, in, in the Niao masking tradition, even God is parodied, kind of. He comes as a character on the scene. Um, Tunga, you know, he comes as a, this huge snake. Anyway, it's a long story, but um, it's, it's a very, it's what, what's called animatic philosophy. It's, 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 it's a philosophy that developed from the observation of the work of energy, you know? It's a philosophy of excess, actually. And Nyao has always been at loggerheads with, uh, with later religions that developed among Malawians. The religions of God, Chisumpi as it's called, and also the idea of centralized governance, you know? So where this masking chief had that, Priests had masks and chiefs had masks because uh, the masks, uh, the mask is something grassroots. It's really very much to do with what it means to be a, a human. Flags belong to certain structures, symbolic uh, structures, structures of power. Um, but the difference is that in my flags, the, the flags are temporal. You know, I, I, they are made by crushing together different flags. Uh, and they are rhythmic, they are transitional, and this is the opposite of what um, um, normal flags do. But it's a Nyao movement, you know. Nyao is very closer to time, to, 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 to the temporal, than it is to, to the symbolic world. And there's something so subversive about that in that um, there's an innate cosmopolitanism in Nyao, you know. It's, 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 it's a it's a very cosmopolitan thinking. So this is how I react as a, as a Malawian traveling. Um, is that I wish there was a, a wish every country only lasted a moment, you know, so. And this is what's happening. So this, this juxtaposition um, of temporal flags versus symbolic ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, and would you talk a bit about now cinema as well, because there's 10 films that are made largely in the Black Forest. 
in the peer exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been making these form of films by your own set of rules for, for about 10 years now. And you filmed, will you talk particularly um, about, there's one film in there, I've seen quite a number of your films. The Beirut film um, is particularly interesting. And while Samson's the main uh, individual shown in the films, uh, essentially it's not kind of you as the main protagonist, other than you're representing a kind of a universal subject in those, when we've talked about it before, a kind of a person without purpose and with an abundance of time and kind of playing around what that is, and in this particularly, playing around in spaces where they're places for leisure and time to be spent, such as parks. The Beirut one is almost the most revealing because it has other characters in it as well. Would you speak a bit about that film and more widely about the now cinema films? Yeah. Um, how did I find myself in... in um in Germany, I think that for me, uh, German idealism, German romanticism, that's an entry point for me as an African. Uh, basically, German ad ad idealism. I, I think uh, starting with Martin Luther, you know, and then, you know, going on to Kant, Hegel. I, I like this idea that in German philosophy, that, that, that the core of the human is not this irrational man of enlightenment, but it's it's a poetic soul. You know, it's almost like madness. <laughs> uh, I think this is what I, I feel I'm closer to uh, it, 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 with the Nyao tradition of where I'm coming from in Malawi. Uh, the mask actually is not trying to hide. The mask is worn to reveal this poetic inner core of the human being. And so I've always been drawn to German philosophy. Uh, when I moved to Oxford, uh, my current studio is uh, belonged to uh, a one, one time uh, Dylan Thomas. It's a cottage, and it's big, you know. So you sit in there. This is you know I have to outdo Dylan Thomas now. So <laughs> it's quite a quite a challenge. <laughs> so what I've done is to uh, I thought okay, I'm sitting in a cottage. How do I look at this? So I had to go to another cottage. I, I knew of Heidegger's cottage in the Black Forest. So this is where I went to get a perspective on the cottage I am in, at, which belonged to drunken Dylan Thomas. Um, and then um, the thing, uh, and again, I think that uh, Heidegger talked about thinking as a form of gift giving. Um, for me, Again, it reveals where I'm coming from in the, in Africa, like in Malawi, and I'm not saying this as an intellectual thing to say, it's true that time is seen as a luxury. You know, 85% um, of the nation are subsistent farmers. Maybe I'm even exaggerating, if I say 85, it's probably closer to 90% of Malawians are subsistent. There's not even what's called working class, you know, in this country. When you read Marxist literature, talks a lot about working classes, like there isn't even the so-called working class in Africa. It's, it's just a lot of it would have been tribal. Um, my, my parents went straight from the village. Uh, their parents were farmers to civil servants in, in, in town. They, they, they didn't even pass through the so-called working class <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, so we have a different conception of time. And when I'm in Europe, I like to seek this time, not just as an intellectual exercise, but it's, it's self-affirming. I feel at home there. Uh, when you conceive time as, um, as an abundance, as something to, to, to be wasted, for instance, uh, then I'm there. And one of the places where you can find that kind of time is, is um, around monuments, and, or like places that are beautiful enough you can make a postcard. And one of these places was Heidegger's cottage is a very popular, it's a beautiful cottage in, in, in the Black Forest. And I wanted to, to, to make a film and just hang out there. And that's what I did. And I was lucky enough to meet Heidegger's family. And um, yeah, I was welcomed, I was showing, I was shown around and we made some films there. Uh, but yes, I was looking for this nonlinear time as an abundance thing. 
and Heidegger was very much into that too. He saw thinking as a form of gift giving and he saw thinking as logic, as a form of negation, that a lot of thinking in, in, in the West is negated as logic. So he, 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 he was interested in approaching thinking as, a, if I put it loosely, maybe as a poetic exercise. And he would sit in this cottage and um, do proper thinking. And, and, and that's what I did. And once I did that, once I was sitting, we sat outside Heidegger's cottage. Uh, they made tea for us. Uh, I was back in Africa, you know. So, um, from that time that you spent with the family in the cottage, mm -hmm. there's two text pieces in the peer exhibition as well. That's another component, and one yeah. of them is a sentence about the interactions. Yeah. So there were. Uh, two interactions. Oh, well, there were many interactions. I, actually, I'm still editing the footage, Charles. But, but um, one incident was that there was a child there, the grand, great granddaughter of Heidegger, who sees me filming there, and suddenly she puts her finger in the crevice uh, on the side of the, the, the uh, of Heidegger's table, uh, the famous Heidegger tea table or uh, picnic table and she called us to have a look and she just put her finger on the side of the table. I, I, I like that moment because I think that she had realized what I was doing, you know. Um, so I thought that was a nyao moment. Another mm -hmm. moment, <laughs> another moment is that uh, I was able to uh, walk towards this cottage and disappear into the cottage without opening it. And so I made a, a film where I just walked towards the house and disappear and come out the other side of the house, in, in, the, in the side of the wall. But that, that's, that, that's the thing about history, is that for me, history is what, it, what is animating my films. My films uh, adopt a certain aesthetic that's inspired by early film. Uh, um, and, and the cut is very... Before I called them my films, uh, uh, Nyao Cinema, I used to call them the Cat Republic, you know, because I, it's, it's just this chop. It's a chop that I use to make my flags. I don't do much to make the flags, it's just a simple cut. And also, uh, my films are made by chopping up the, the footage and rearranging it into patterns. And um, for me, that chop is history. So that's why I like to go to places that are loaded with history, because then it's the history that animates, that decides on what pattern, what patterns my films should take. And when I was there, uh, the, 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 the cottage was really responsible for moving my films. And of course, uh, the connection there seems to be far-fetched, but actually a lot of my uncles and grandparents fought the Germans in, 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 in North Africa, in, in, <laughs> In, in, um, in Europe, um, there is, uh, uh, it sounds like, why are you happening in uh, sitting with Heidegger's family? But we had a discussion about the wars. And, and uh, I, um, but even that cottage, even the Black Forest, I met my history as an African, you know? I, uh, if you look at my films carefully, you can start to work out on detail, but that, that's the, uh, uh, that's the first thing. And would you talk a bit about, we've spoken before about the films, mm -hmm. obviously there's a kind of Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin aspect yeah. to that absurdism that's in itself, an observation on life. We've talked before about your experience as a, with your brother of going to see films. Would you talk a little bit about how films were shown when you were a child as public events? Yeah, so um, uh, when I was growing up in my, it grew up under the, the dictator, you know, uh, Banda. Mm -hmm. And um, censorship was big, you know, a lot of um, the films what we, that we saw were heavily censored. Um, that's one. Uh, but the other thing is that simply the projectionists were looking for a certain sense of time. The sense of time in the film has to be for moment, a, a series of raptures rather than um, these big Zionian kind of duration, you know, you, you want more a bachelor series of rapture. So, so the, the projectionists would edit the films 
So if you if you went to see James Bond uh, 007, suddenly it changes changes to Bruce Lee. Because <laughs> the next good scene happened to Bruce Lee, so that's if you bring it in. And um, so this, uh, when I started making films here, I didn't even think about it. That's how I chopped up my footage. I, I speeded up things that I didn't like. Or, things more make more interesting and simply did them that way because this this form of film was just what I saw in my childhood. So much so that the breaking down of film was part of the art of the projectionist. Um, he would load the film and then you he would put the button on and then it would show and then it would fall to the ground and you would pick it up, load it again and this I just and a good projectionist would make the breaking down of film part of his art. And this is what I do too, is the disinfunctionality of film is part of the Nyao cinema practice. We used to call um, this form, form of film a, a Nyao cinema. Uh, and it was mainly used, if shown in church halls, like the cup, there was a famous one in Blantyre where I grew up to, uh, it was called the St. Pius. And, uh, and, uh, for me, I think film had come to replace masking, you know, where the movie star becomes the mask. And, and so that's how I see film, you know, that's, that's how I, I, I knew of this aesthetic, but I was only able to do it the first time I got my MacBook Pro. I thought, wow, I could easily travel in time. So once I got that computer, I almost at once uh, rediscovered Nyao cinema. It's like going back in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also you were saying about how you make some of those films when well, we've yeah. chatted in the past in terms of inviting people into the process, either of filming and with the film Beirut that's in the Pier exhibition as well. Mm -hmm. The little girl um, who starts to, encouraged by your playfulness, uh, starts to just do what she thinks is the right thing to do as well, which is to kind of play and climb on that horse's head sculpture. And would you yeah. talk a bit about the social interactions that are outside of the frame usually? Um, yeah. the unusually, the, you, this is the first time you've had some of that social interaction you've left in the edit. Yeah, I, I, I think it's also the first time that I, I filmed my f the films on my, on my own. I used a tripod because I wanted to get this postcard effect. And, um, but usually my films are filmed by strangers. That's the whole point, is that I go to a place loaded with history, with a camera in my pocket. I use a, a digital camera, you know, I don't use my phone. But, but, but uh, and something with a lot of meat in it. And then I walk the city on a derive, if you like, a situationist thing there. And when I see this poetic moment, when I see this character, uh, I see them, you know, it's like going hunting. You know, I'm very late when I'm trying to make my film. And when I see that moment, a poetic moment, a nyao moment, if you like, I stop a strange and say, can you film me? So I start performing, trying to uh, realize what I have seen in my, you know, vision. And then usually people want to stay in touch with me because it's usually a very abstract performance. And they want to follow it through. They say, what are you going to do with this? <laughs> and then oh, they were, oh, I'm going to follow you. So they follow me on YouTube or Facebook. And um, so it's a very social thing, you know? And it, going to the film that you, that you saw, uh, I just set this camera up and I make friends that way. But quicker with kids because children don't seem to be looking for anything behind it. They just take it for what it is. If, if I'm performing, if I'm doing an act, they will just join. Well, adults wants to find out what's going on first. <laughs> let's send me that link. And then, uh, and they go, oh, let's do these films. It's like too late, I'm in another city. But the kids just uh, are trusting, they jump into it, and, and I think that's what it is. You just, um, um, but I have made friends uh, the world over because of uh, this form of uh, socialized, filmmaking practice, you know. If I went to a park here in London or in Sweden, in Stockholm, 
and just approach somebody and start a conversation, they'll walk right away, you know? Or if I sat in a bus, it's difficult. But somehow, when you uh, put film between me and strangers, they always become my friends immediately, as if they've known me before. Uh, and, and this was how masks were also used in, um, in Africa. That when you wear a mask, you have a more generous persona, you know? You're a more generous person. And where there's true generosity, connections are made. So that's why the masks in the village have to come out and again and again. Because when, when the masks are come out, people let their guard down. And if people, people's guard is down like children at play, they will make real friends. You will, uh, it's like magic. Uh, and and it is, uh, uh, yeah, so for me, uh, the, the process of filmmaking has been a way of finding my place here, you know? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it changes the social contract, essentially, whether it's a mask or the <coughs> filming and offering people to film you, that kind of... Without play, you, you, without play, you can almost not connect with adults. This is why perhaps you realize that friends that you stay friends with, they are the ones who you had lots of time to waste, like in high school. You know, colleagues never come your friends. You know, if you say, let's meet on Thursday, you do, friendship will never come. If you say, let's meet next month on Sunday, never. Friendship only comes when you have lots of time to, when you get into this so-called nyao time, non-linear, uh, spontaneous time, then you can make a real friend. I think it's true. Um, and getting an adult to play is impossible. It's, it's, it's impossible almost. It's very natural for kids. Kids are trusting. They can, uh, to get adults play, that's why you have uh, these whole rituals developed in Africa, trying to trick the adult, like bring the masks out, or creativity, write a poem, play a song, you know play it's quite a um we know the solution the solution is in play but it doesn't make it easier it doesn't make it like um it doesn't mean that you can simply play and get people to play you have to find real to get them to honest their play is 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 is, is a is a trick yeah mm -hmm. and in your mm -hmm. postcard mm -hmm. works in the peer exhibition mm -hmm. there's certain frames they're not like one uniform scene produced again and again, which is the, the convention of tourist postcards, there'll be moments where the subject, mm -hmm. which is, you, is like mm -hmm. dashing across the field or doing something or doing something unexpected usually in the space or there's no one in the space. And so actually the closer you look, the more that you see there's flickers of all sorts of different behavior mm. in those free spaces. Would you talk about the postcards and the idea of postcards for you within this? Because that's a new yeah. body of work. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that interests me about the postcards is that the photograph is that it's an index, you know. It's arbitrary that you have to ex exclude, you know. But the truth is that when you see one photograph, you see loads of photographs. You could say that my films are actually the whole photograph, mm. including what's been excluded, you know. If you think of art in, in terms of where I'm coming from, you have to include the excluded. In fact, in Africa, it's the excluded that matters, you know, the exception. That's why you see masks are made up of things that fall to the ground, you know? Uh, and the postcards you've spoken about before are some of your early films in particular, uh, sort of messages through time as postcards are, but also to show your sisters what you're doing and kind of communicate back to family yeah, and friends it's, as well. Yeah, it's, it's a form of writing, it's like scribbling, but I, I, um, I thought I would do postcards that show everything, not only the, the ideal scene, but also what's been excluded. Of course, that's a political side to that, because when I'm traveling, if I'm in France or in London, those uh, places of, of, of picturesque enough to, to become postcards are also where the hustlers and idlers hang out, drug dealers, um, like we at Yale, there was this beautiful garden just outside, but this is where all the junkies were. You wouldn't know if, if uh, 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 this um, sense of time. Um, but it's political in that, in that uh, if I'm talking of 
an exclusive composition. It means it, it means <laughs> it's a world that accommodates somebody like me who is traveling or an immigrant or migrant, <laughs> whatever. So so so. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that uh, so, so somehow um, in uh, this is what shocked the. Um, the colonials is that the African in, in, in capability of excluding, you know, y you know. So if you went into an African village, what the missionaries found is that the healthy were together with the sick, whatever, the mad and the same. Nobody was excluded. The village functioned as if you've got a mad sister or a mad brother, you have to live with them. If, if, you've got a, if your parents are too old, you have to live with it. You don't ship them out. So. It's quite a challenge, mm -hmm. but I think we are, we are of course, adopting these methods of exclusion is in Africa now, but I think there's a certain romance in, in living with uh, the exception, you know? It's, it's uh, in Nyao, definitely, you live with the exception. Live with, with, it's, in fact, the Nyao philosophy is comp competitive suffering. You know, there, there is, the, villages, the villages compete to see who, is suff who can suffer the most and still ascent to life. It's, it's, it's a sport in Africa. So God, you lived, you lost 10 kids and you still have a smile. You lost your hand, you lost all your teeth and you still can master the biggest smile. And, and people wear their suffering like a badge. You know, it's, 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 it's a possible philosophy, a, a philosophy that embraced suffering rather than excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what is insinuated by including all these things that are supposed to be rejected and put at the door. Mm -hmm. And it goes with the idea of abundance and things being all together at once and unavoidable somehow, which in the exhibition, because it's a relatively mm. small space yeah. and could be in a, been in a larger, more expanded museum display in terms of five bodies of work, but they're interwoven mm. together and we're within the work. You have to kind of manoeuvre around the work essentially, to be in that space. And you've yeah. spoken as well about mm -hmm. the idea of audience being very different in terms of, say, Malawi, whether it's the films being edited so it's the most exciting bits that people want to see, disregarding the original kind of narrative intent, or the idea that people want to be included and there's more active involvement. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. whilst this work isn't participatory, so to speak, the idea is the exhibition is with people as they're in the space all together. Yeah. Yeah, it, th these are uh, uh, deeply uh, philosophical. Uh, there is an element, the other heritage that what we have is the Christian element, you know. Uh, I mean, um, basically, uh, before Christianity comes on the scene, this is controversial. There is the Imperial Rome, uh, basically, that believes in the whole, which is the excluded, uh, the, 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 uh, the whole at the expense of, you know, the exception. And then, then you have the, the Jewish culture, if you like, that's built on the exception. Mm. So Christianity brings the, the whole and the exception together. The exception lives together with the whole. And uh, I think that's the, that's the politics of Nyao too, traditionally. It, it's the, um, of course, in Africa, the chiefs are always trying to exclude. You know, they're always trying to exclude the weak, whatever, and to... And the grassroots is always resisting. It says, no, 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 no. That, that's what's happening in London. Is London going to be excited when we ship out all the poor people and we just remain with all the rich? It's also a question of London. I think London has been exciting for a long time because it mixed everything. Like my studio at Chelsea in, in Kensa Green, I could go Chelsea, <laughs> very posh. Well, I could go to Harrisden. Uh, I like that choice. I think it made things exciting. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, um, 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 the, the, uh, this is the politics in that the work that you see in the show could be shown differently. But I feel that's not my job to, to display these things. Maybe Kate will do it for me, but for <laughs> as, as, as long as it's my show. As an artist, I feel that I'm more interested in process, in possibility. Like the, um, uh, I think it's very transitional. Even the Grey War is very transitional. It's it's not a permanent war. I, I don't know. I see it more like a, a moment behind the flags, and then you have to imagine that maybe the the, the war goes back to white. Or um, it's very. 
Yeah, I'm definitely fighting against the classical uh, mode of presentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's something political about it. Yeah. And with your work being very much an art practice that's essentially a research and working through over time different areas of research, there's mm. a number of figures in the space as well kind of with the audience. And those figures are actually part of your visual research that you're doing into mm. history <coughs> within Malawi. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. those images are actually from the Western Library in Oxford. And would you talk a bit about those figures, both the Echo Homo and the windows, and also the figures that are in the space? In terms of yeah, so A.K. Homer, I think I've touched on the theme of Christianity, and again, Christianity was embraced in, uh, in Africa because we see Jesus as a Nyao figure, you know. Uh, St. Paul has a very good interpretation of what Christ means. He says Christ is important because he's died and he's resurrected. It's simply that movement. It's a, for me, it's a Nyao movement. It's almost like a film, you know. Christ dies and the next moment is up. <laughs> That's a new movement. That's, that's a movement of my film, you know? It's, you have to be happy enough that it moves at all. You have to be happy enough. Because that's a new movement in my opinion. It, 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 it alludes to this kind of eternal immanence. Um, in psychoanalysis, maybe the so-called death drive, you know? The, 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 the all equalizing force, you know? Uh, the, 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 uh, um, so, um, uh, There's some specific historical figures as well. It yeah. mentioned here about the Harry yeah. Johnson, so, so but also the, 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 guy, um, the, the guy, John Chalembwe, as well as somebody else you're very much exploring. Yeah, so the guy on the window is Sir Harry Johnson. Uh, he's the one who pacified Malawi. Pacify meaning subjugate all the chiefs that way. He was an artist, actually, but he seemed to be surviving a lot of the campaigns. He wasn't a soldier, but he would come out clean out of Africa every now and then. So they, they speeded him up and made him a soldier when he wasn't and, uh, and sent him to Malawi to, to take care of the last remaining resisting chiefs. And so he, on that picture, he's with a Malawian um, um, prisoner, but it's staged, obviously, for, for the camera. And he displays himself as a Roman general and, and again, you know, the whole, this is the exception uh, that I've discussed. And um, there are six soldiers that were imported from India and my great grandfather was Indian. So it's, it's a very complex presentation because I'm part of, and, and my mother was from South Africa. My dad is the one who uh, comes from a very ancient tribe in the middle of Africa. The Chewa are uh, like prehistoric. I've always been in Africa, but a lot of people around there, like my mother or like the, my Indian ancestors, they're from all over. Um, but I like that it's, it's this kind of histories that are animating my films. Usually I don't include these histories in my films, but this time I've done this, uh, been generous. And, um, and then it goes to um, the soldiers that are inside. Um, but the soldiers are connected to my films in that in my films, you could say that I'm a form of a dandy, if you like, to, to put it simply. But if you want to know the origin of the African dandy, it comes from these soldiers, you know? They are the ones who developed um, the, the Malawian syncretic tradition, which includes the dandy. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, these soldiers contextualize um, what I'm trying to do. Um, um, it, We've talked as well before I mean, in mm. our, some of our conversations around, because it's slightly unusual that you refer to in Africa, like as a whole nation, mm -hmm. and make statements or comments as referring to such a colossal continent, uh, mm -hmm. cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. And when uh, we were talking about that and I was asking you, you were explaining that actually that's partly born out of a frustration at the narrowness of the paradigm in which people are thinking it's in the UK and in Northern Europe sometimes. So it's in part to try and expand people's thinking about the world. So mm -hmm. the, with the, the exploration of time in relation to one's existence being quite a universal philosophical idea, but mm -hmm. then you invite us as individual subjects 
to think beyond the conventional assumptions that we have and to recognise very much we're in a relatively narrow paradigm of understanding. Mm. And there's certain individuals within your practice who you're particularly interested in. They're, you have a show on as well in Belgium at the moment. Mm, yeah. And in that, there's a work of hats dedicated to um, Chalambwe. And would you yeah. talk more about him as a figure, because he's somebody you're in the midst of doing a kind of deep dive research into, but who yeah. you also grew up with knowing a lot about as a Malawian? Yeah, I say controversially that I find that, uh, you know, I grew up between two worlds. And, and by the time I was 13, I went to a boarding school, a British boarding school, you know, so I, I'm able to sit in the two worlds, the West and Africa. Uh, the two extremes uh, in me and um, but from my experience of art in Africa I think that through my western education I thought that the situation is come closest to how I would I experienced art in Africa which is as an infrastructure as opposed to superstructure uh, my western education involved a lot of mimesis mimetic tradition of art it took me a long time to to, to position myself in in, the, in in what I am now, which is a more kind of uh, non a, a, a more kind of art as infrastructure, art as praxis, as opposed to let's say just practice. Um, uh, but yeah, in in Africa, in Malawi, the Nyao tradition is a praxis. You know, you don't. When the masks, you don't hang your masks in the house. You must come out to perform a certain function and art is within the everyday life. Uh, and the point is not a representation. There are elements of representation in African art, but that's not a point. And when you start talking about things like that, then you are closer to the situationists who came after Dad and surrealism, who were precisely trying to get out of the mimetic paradigm. It said that surrealism, for instance, is not <coughs> part of Western art history because its interest lied elsewhere. It didn't lie in the representation. And so for me, that's why I was drawn out to um, situationism. Now, situationism is looking for alternative ways of doing art. And it had interest in the gift economy and that we have lots of it in Africa. Africa is called the fourth world or the third world, but that's because, because we still have the, the, the gift culture. Um, that's it's not well understood, but you know. Uh, but one of the guys who I feel for me is a proto-situationist in Malawi is John Chilembwe, who was, um, who is a kind of African, who Af a group of Africans who found themselves in between the traditional chiefs and the the colonials on the other side. And John Chilembe tried to instigate a, 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 an uprising in Malawi in 1915. Uh, the difference, what's unique about this uprising was that it wasn't, he wasn't a tribesman to, 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 to rising up against the British. He was trying to, to governize the new Malaw modern Malawians. And uh, his name actually is the name also of, of a principal Nyao mask. So his uh, uprising was very kind of a grassroots, but he used, instead of using traditional methods of subversion, he used modern methods. And one of his modern methods was like dandaism, you know, a form of fashion. He had, a, um, he started a, a mission in Africa and he insisted that all his followers dress up and hang out and which the British didn't want because uh, the, the, the colonials wanted Africans in the fields working but he, 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 when he came back from America, he, he, he brought all these sewing machines and stuff and he had all the congregation dressed. And of course they killed him for that. One of the reasons he was killed is for the right to wear a hat before a white person, for instance, which was forbidden. You we're not even allowed to wear shoes in the uh, um, in a period of colonialism as an African, you are not allowed. So you can see there's a lot of photography in Africa where the African is wearing a suit but his bare feet. That's because there's a white guy in it, uh, uh, nearby. A and then he moved on to hearts and so forth. So Chilembe rebelled against that. And of course he was killed, but I, I felt in his bury on um, the methods that he used, uh, the dandaism, the, 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 the flamboyance of his approach to subversion, uh, 
Because by dressing up, he's alluding to the traditional and linear time, time outside of work. And this is also the, the time, the kind of the time that the situation is we're looking for. So for me, he's, he, he was a prototype and Chilembe inspired many Africans after him, uh, in, including many that started the political movements in, uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, Malawi, because of its Nyao tradition, has produced a lot of subversive political leaders in Southern Africa, not only in Malawi, but in Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa. Because uh, the, the Nyao tradition I've told you about, this grassroots masking tradition is, is a truly the opposite of power. It's truly something that really works. One of the ways in which we've had lots of conversations, actually, is both being based in Oxford and the affordance of time that you have there in terms is something that you enjoy very much in terms of the universities. The, their notion of legacy is exceedingly long term in its approach, which is what's striking being somebody very outside the university when you do kind of cross that strange walled threshold is that actually this is power built over exceedingly long periods of time. And so the ways in which conversations are held, uh, the ways in which dinners or other things are done are, are very expended periods of time because the conversation and time spent and the quality of conversation is extremely primary in a way that actually is one of the things that's quite distinctive about having been, for me, working in Oxford for the last five years. This is the first time I've come across anything of that sort, having... Um, not gone to a school like that or a university like that. And it's really striking the relationship with quality of conversation and time. And you enjoy, you're enjoying that kind yeah, of I, I think different form of ritual. Uh, Oxford definitely belongs to this sense of time because it's from the Middle Ages. It's, this is pre capital. Oxford is pre capital. And the values there, they're really pre capital. They're, 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 there's a difference between me, between Europe and the West. Which West is associated with capital? For me, Europe is very much within the gift tradition I'm talking about, um, which you know Europe perhaps had to get rid of after the Reformation. But in Oxford, it still lingers. You know, I'm very much at home there. The sense of time at Oxford, the scholar is is a gift giver. You know, is, is he practices this sense of time? I don't know how long it will last, but Oxford remains a place where. Uh, being a scholar is a lifestyle. It's not necessarily about, you know, making a profit. I don't know. It, it, it's the monastic tradition still lingers at Oxford. Mm. So, uh, as an African, surprisingly, this is the most at home place I have. But I found myself I'm more at home in Oxford than I was ever, maybe even in London. Yeah. Mm. So, um, but. Mm -hmm. So Oxford still retains the leech wars, the time-wasting leech wars, you know, the formalities, the marching in, the processions, uh, the flowery lang language, the, the whole drama of being in time. Um, that's Africa, you know, ironically. <laughs> so, and when I say Africa, we say it, I think that uh, we say it where, where people say, oh, but Africa is huge. Just like, well, the, the general economy of most of Africa is, 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 um, is the same in as much as then you also don't have right to say Europe because the Europeans are different. The Germans are different from the French and the French are different from the English. From the, but that's, you know, the longer you stay here, you realize that actually Europeans are very different. But there's a general economy. And the same in Africa, fine. People may different, be different from tribe to tribe, but there's a general economy. And one of the things that really unites the tribes in Southern Africa is this conception of time. Uh, time as non-linear, time as an abundance, time as a luxury. You know, there's lots of time, don't worry about it. It's, you know, and, and it's funny that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I would. Uh, uh, when I went, I was a thirteen. My a lot of my teachers were British, or, or all of them, at, um, European at least. They would say, "Quick, what do you want? What do you want? Say quickly!" So the faster you were, the more direct, the more they saw you as as good. Well, with my parents, if you went back home or in the villages with my grandparents, the, the more direct you are, the more you don't try to waste their time. They will see it rude. It's almost like very rude. In Malawi, you almost have to take your time in your delivery 
You know, you don't just go to somebody and say, can I use your bicycle? You, 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 you spend 30 minutes trying to nest your way into. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Stop and say thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure.